Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to another, another of our Webinar Wednesdays hosted by the California State University Bakersfield Small Business Development Center. This is episode number 119 of live Webinar Wednesdays since the beginning of the pandemic titled Managing Your Small Business Beyond the Pandemic and being in that recovery mode and are we beyond the pandemic? Anyway, other things to discuss today. So, so welcome again. Uh, let's get on with what is going to be a great webinar today. So what's up today? Today we're up to June 22nd, 2022. And we're seeing kind of out there that the economic news is still dominating our business outlook, our business recovery, and our business optimism moving forward as small businesses. So we'll talk a little bit about the economic news, trying to stay a word away from those things that we've talked so much about um, on our economic corner today. We're going to try to ignore the R word and the I word, if we can, be in recession and inflation. So we'll look at some of the things that are also some of the economic news that could be impacting you and your business today or down the road. Also, CalSavers, CalSavers, which is the mandatory retirement program. Uh, compliance is due for many small businesses coming up on June 30th. If you have not done so, uh, that is a program that if you are out of compliance, you are subject to uh, potential fees and penalties. So no cost to you to get it signed up. We'll kind of refer back to a couple of webinars that we've done on this in a little bit and give you some guidance if you need to know more about the Cal Savers program. But the compliance aspect of it is you need to be signed up by June 30th. And that is for uh, if you have five employees or more. So today our spotlight is going to be on social media. Got a great program. I'm really looking forward to it myself. Our Capital Corner is going to look at the EB-5 program. And the EB-5 program, which was modified in April of this year, is a federal program. And what it does is it allows individuals that make a significant business investment, uh, investment in, say, a startup, a tech business, or other business to the tune of about 800000 they qualify for a green card and for uh, residents in the United States. So uh, a very popular program that goes back to the 1990s, uh, received some significant modifications earlier this year. We'll look at some of that and some of the potential shovel-ready projects. Uh, our marketing maze, uh, we got a lot of marketing going on today. So uh, we were going to bring in a well-played commercial in the interest of time and to uh, donate probably that amount of time back to real good marketing purposes rather than what I had planned for you. Uh, we'll probably put that off a week. So, and as always, we're going to take your questions at the end of today's webinar. Please use the Q&A box uh, and we will also uh, be putting some good information and topics and links in the chat box. So we'll hit the Q&A box at the end of the presentation today and kind of move that direction. So uh, what is, with 119 consecutive live webinars, a few of those topics kind of stand out as if you are still looking for more information on certain aspects that have happened. Uh, for example, the California Dream Fund, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel where you'll find all of these webinars and many more. Um, number 117 back on June 8th was on the California Dream Fund and signing up for that particular program. On May 18th, we had Celeste Young Ramos, and she talked about some of the HR and California law update. And she did cover Cal Savers there. It was also covered back on March 30th in webinar number 107 with Jonathan Herrera from the uh, from the uh, treasurer's office of the state of California. Also, uh, interesting ones of note, I think that there's still a lot going on with small business and uh, cybersecurity. Uh, Mr. Bill Britton was on, and on May 11th, you might be interested in getting the economic update from Dr. Mark Evans uh, that was presented at that time. So uh, th they're all available on demand, and those are particular topics, particularly with the Cal Savers being timely and being mandatory. You can get a lot of that information in the March 30th, 2022 webinar. 
So uh, an update on some of the key programs as far as some of the status and some of the action that might be required from you. Our California Dream Fund, which is, of course, that $5,000 or $10,000 uh, of money that is available to you to start a business. If you're interested, you can actually send us an email at sbdc at csub.edu. We have had a few of the training programs that have gone through it. If you recall, the California Dream Fund program, what it does is it, uh, after an individual who wants to start a business goes through a process of a 12-topic training program, followed by one-on-one -on -one consulting with one of our SBDC consultants, and then writes a business plan could be eligible for five to $10,000. Now that is a lot of work for some seed capital, five to 10 grand, a lot of work uh, and a, lot, a big effort and a big lift by you individually. Even if you did, were not to qualify for the five or 10,000, I still see the tremendous value in actually the consultant, the training, and also the actual process of writing the business plan. But you can email us to be included. Um, funding, I believe, is still available. They are waitlisting some of the upcoming training events. As I mentioned, I think two of them are either completed or nearing completion, and they will be offered throughout the summer. We've been talking a little bit, and this is really going to get to be uh, a, a big topic here on Webinar Wednesday, and that's the State Small Business Credit Initiative. And what there is, is there's going to be startup money and startup uh, capital for investment purposes through this program that comes out of the, uh, the ARPA, the ARPA um, program, and came through the U.S. Treasury to the tune of $10 billion in the state of California. We get nearly a billion of that. And it is going to be really kind of rolling out. I think in the next couple of months, we'll have representatives on and we'll talk about that. So if you're looking for small business capital, there is going to be capital quarter, definitely uh, kind of pivotalized. We also have our Kern County micro grant program that is still open. And so $2,500 micro grants to the smallest and neediest small businesses in Kern County. You're going to need your 2019 taxes. You're going to have to have revenue of less than $50,000 for that year of 2019 and document that on a tax return. There's some other provisions on the application, which is a simple two-page applications. There are other rules. Please apply if you, uh, if you, uh, it can. If you uh, doesn't look like you're going to qualify, don't apply. Up in Mono County, I uh, was in Mono County yesterday, had some great conversations and meetings. And in Mono County, they have the Grant and Forgivable Loan Program. It is open still. Uh, this is CDBG related funding that rolls through the county of Mono. And actually, you are going to want to contact one of the two Jeffs up there, the Economic Development Manager, Jeff Simpson, and also the individual that they use, Jeff Lucas, who is a consultant um, that works that particular program. But that is still open. The employee retention credit uh, through the Internal Revenue Service is still open retroactively. The last quarter that you could use for wages in that program was the third quarter. So it ended September 30th, 2021. So the employee retention credit is open retroactively. Uh, most people that I know that have, have realized this and have gone back and qualified do so by amending their quarterly uh, uh, IRS 941 forms. So your quarterly tax returns would need to be amended from that period. Contact either uh, your accountant or your CPA. You can contact also your payroll related firm. Find out the cost in advance because some of these people out there are really, really charging a percentage to help you when uh, if you factor that into an hourly rate. Um, some of the services out there that are specializing in this are really taking a pretty hefty lift and cut out of that uh, credit. And we did mention the Cal Savers Mandatory uh, Employment Program, and you're going to uh, want to sign up by the 30th. So we did give you a little bit on the Kern County Micro Grant Program. There's our telephone number, 661-654-2856, if you want to get more information on this. Um, we uh, would also like you to sign up for free consulting because uh, really take a look at the bigger picture of your micro business and see what other needs you might have other than besides maybe just the $2,500 grant that's available here. 
the value of the consulting and some good advice might really go a long ways toward doing more. Uh, we talked about uh, the wonderful acronym, the SSBCI, the State Small Business Credit Initiative, and we'll be talking about that more. And so that brings us to our little economic corner, which is our side of the relevant economic news that's happening in our world today. And there was an interesting report that came out. Uh, it was the report actually that came out through a payroll service, ADP. And they had come up with a report. And I really, who knows more about what is happening with small business rather than, you know, one of the larger payroll companies out there. So they have come out and they have came out with a report that said a lot of the hiring squeeze that has impacted small business over the last year or the entire economy, not only small business, big business, everybody else, that mostly small businesses are getting the brunt of that. And small businesses, they defined as 50 employees and less. So a rather detailed report and uh, really kind of, um, uh, really kind of shows the heartbreak and the heartache out there for those that are looking for valued employees and need employees to keep the doors open and keep hours extended to uh, the workday that you want to actually have. So President Biden uh, called on a three-month suspension of the gas tax. And so the gas tax, the federal tax, I don't know, it's about 18 cents a gallon or so. Um, it's interesting because the uh, state of California hasn't really gone a long ways toward getting a resolve. There's a lot of differences on how the state has talked about doing some form of relief for those that... Uh, that drive uh, automobiles, it's just figuring out the way to do so. And obviously you small businesses that have fleets and uh, delivery type businesses are so impacted by this and really by the use of your automobile in order to make a, and earn a living. So it calls for the suspension. And it's interesting because the state sales tax, which is on gasoline, if you remember back uh, not too long ago when gas was $2 a gallon during pre-pandemic potentially, or at the beginning of the pandemic, say two bucks a gallon, that has tripled. So the state sales tax on that amount of money has tripled as well. Um, you know, this, the federal gas tax, it's a per gallon tax. So it has really not gone up. And now we're starting to see cuts in consumption. As the price goes up, people try to figure out ways of driving less. And so that gas tax is already kind of slipping, uh, sliding originally. But in addition to the California gas tax, the sales tax is really, really kicking in and providing so much revenue for the state. So hopefully we see something on that somewhat soon. We see something also going on with home sales. Uh, we had a record in home sales with the median price of a home across the country, $400,000. Who would have thought? Um, across the country, 400,000, not in California. So um, many are anticipating now a home sales bust as interest rates go up and demand remains tight. Uh, but that affordability aspect with the raising interest rates, and we had Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, mentioned that raising rates is going to happen and rates are going to continue to go up in testimony to Congress this week. Uh, raising rates to battle inflation might, need, might lead to recession. So still a lot going on in economics, and I did my best to try to stay away from uh, inflation and recession, but it's almost impossible. Last week, I talked almost exclusively about some of the things that were going on with uh, inflation, or excuse me, recession. Oh yeah, and re inflation, both. So our capital quarter, I talked a little bit about a quick look at the EB-5 program. This is something where you have uh, a, a, an individual or a actually agency, a group that actually negotiates the, the money. Uh, and a lot of the rules, but really Congress did everybody a favor by really loosening some of the rules. And really what they did was they really made it for rural areas now where you have um, somebody who wants to invest $800,000. And now they're looking for shovel ready projects in rural areas, these firms that are dealing with EB-5s. And we'll be talking a lot more about this in the next coming weeks. It's kind of ironic here, we're talking about raising interest rates, which make projects more uh, or actually less affordable and doing it to slow down the economy. And then all of a sudden comes this opportunity for these projects that maybe should have already been built. Many of them in rural areas that now have the opportunity to actually happen. So a lot of that is gonna be going toward early stage capital, which is the initial 
capital for uh, uh, some new tech and other startups. So that early stage is the riskiest form of money that's out there. It's uh, coming off the idea stage. It's maybe a prototype, but really generally early stage has no sales. It uh, hasn't even gotten near the sales stage yet. So that early stage, but also there's some expansion capital that might be possible. But again, uh, our capital quarter focus is going to remain, and I see I'm running out of time, uh, uh, for the rural components and rural areas. So if you were on last week, you heard me say something that I thought I'd never say and uh, how maybe recession might be good for small business. And remember, small businesses are hammered by recession generally, especially a hard, deep set recession, not on a soft landing where we bounce right back like we did after COVID, but one that sits in and digs in for you know a considerable uh, number of months. But one thing that happens during these type is uh, corporations, they use it as an opportunity to cut payroll. Now, they've been looking for people, too. So maybe that equilibrium balance before between the shortage that we have in the, uh, the jobs market, the jobs uh, scene, so to speak, uh, might take a little while to balance out. But there's going to be some people that are likely going to be let loose if there is a recession from some of the bigger companies that are looking to land, and they could be landing at smaller businesses. So also, you know, um, be looking and be thinking about ways that that would be probably the best outcome if you're looking to do something. Okay, we were going to, I was going to show the, uh, and I'm glad I didn't, uh, I, I, no time. But next week, what we're going to do is we're going to, in marketing maze, we're going to look at no gas, no squeegee. And no gas, no squeegee is a commercial for a hybrid automobile. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, I started watching it. Uh, I, I started watching it and I started getting, uh, I don't know, I started getting kind of flustered because it seemed like the hero and the villain of the uh, commercial uh, I thought should have been swapped. So anyway. Uh, it would have been a great topic for the social media, but moving on. And moving on right now is to get to introduce our special guest today. And our special guest is Melissa Forziat. And no, that's next week. That's not this week. Uh, Melissa is a Southern California-based speaker and marketer. A uh, consultant and author, she works with small business owners to develop and execute marketing strategies, business organizations, train the trainer, and other types of things. Uh, she's an Olympic level speaker with keynotes, workshops, breakout sessions, and now a webinar Wednesday under her belt. Travels the world bringing high-powered insight to audiences, startups, corporate teams, and small business owners. She has a free ebook. I think she'll probably mention that and a companion workbook, Small Business Marketing on a Budget. Before starting, uh, Melissa Forziat Events and Marketing, early career involved the Winter Games, Rugby World Cup, and the U.S. Olympic Committee. Through many of her experiences with some of the biggest brands in the world, she learned the principles of building a strong brand and delivering the right message and right audience at the right time. Passionate about her work and clients, Melissa, Melissa adds a pinch of her own improv comedy with a dash of practicality and finds that effective marketing solution that allows businesses to thrive. Melissa, I'm tired of reading. Come on and join us. Uh, I know you're a former gymnast, never made it quite to the Olympics, but everybody already reads faster than me and you already saw that. So Melissa, it's great to have you on today. Thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we'll just make sure that we get my slides up here in just a moment. I will go ahead and make that happen for you all so we can jump right in. Uh, thank you again for having me. A huge thank you to Kelly and Maureen for bringing me out to uh, virtually to talk to all of you at CSU Bakersfield SBDC. This is a, an honor to be the 119th presentation in this series. I'm a huge believer in consistency. And this is a model for that, that, you know, the SBDC is really showing you what it looks like to stay consistent and how that can influence an audience. Um, so let me tell you just a little bit more background on me to help put some context to this. We're going to talk about social media today, but you would have heard when Kelly was introducing me that I started out doing those major international sport events, Olympic Winter Games, Rugby World Cup. 
working with the U.S. Olympic Committee. So those are some of the biggest brands in the world. And they're certainly dealing with a different level of resources than we would be as small business owners. When I started my own business 10 years ago, I have a micro business. I'm sure many of you have micro businesses as well. And we have to figure out how to market when we don't have the same resources that an Olympic Games would have. We still have to be effective in getting to our audience and building trust and ultimately getting them to buy what we sell. So the trick with social media is that as much as there's a push to spend money on advertising, we want to talk about what's whatever is within your means, if this is a strategy that you're using to market. So that's the angle that I'll be taking on this today. Now, a few quick housekeeping items before we jump in. First of all, although you're all on mute today, please go ahead and minimize distractions on your end. The more you're able to focus on your business and the context of this material, the more you're gonna get from it. So silence your phone. If you have a messaging device on in the background, go ahead, shut those things off now so you can really focus in. Now I'm gonna have a lot of slides to present to you and a lot of different ideas. And in case you feel like you're really rushing to take notes, I wanted to tell you up front that I've packaged up a few different things for you and put them on a landing page of my website that I'm giving to Maureen and Kelly after this so that they can distribute it to you. That includes the slide deck. There's gonna be an additional exercise that I'll mention along the way. And then I have a few additional blogs for more reading. So keep looking for that landing page link at the end. And that will be a good resource for you if you wanna keep doing further work on this. And in terms of questions, we will take questions at the end, but there are gonna be a couple of times that I ask you questions along the way, use those opportunities to get into the chat and put your answers there. I'd like to get a sense of uh, what your experience is with marketing and um, how, how this material is landing for everybody. Now, just to make sure you all know where the chat is, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name and your business. Feel free to jump in there. Make sure everybody can see your responses if you're able to set it that way. It should be set to everyone. And we'll just keep going from there. But I've introduced myself. We might as well have you all introduce yourselves too. So here's how we'll approach this today. We're going to talk about why are you social media marketing? What is the purpose of what you're trying to do? And then how do you match that purpose with the actual audiences you're trying to reach? Then we're going to look at two of the objectives more closely. We're going to look at showcasing your brand, and we're going to look at creating conversation. But here's what we're not going to be talking about today. And I wanted to say this up front. I just hinted at it, but just to make sure we're all in the right place today, we're not going to be talking about paid advertising in its many forms. All of the things on this slide here, you know, the ad budgets and the boosting and pixels and all of that. It's great information. However, what we're talking about today is more relationship building and organic marketing on social media, community building. Because while the advertising tools that I just had up, those can expedite the reach of an already good social media marketing plan, they're not a replacement for a good social media marketing plan. If you aren't nurturing the audience, the, all those leads that you're collecting through advertising, you're probably going to end up have, seeing them drop out of your pipeline at some point, and it ends up being money that you weren't using efficiently. So I want to make sure you first understand, how do I nurture the leads that I get? And then once I know how to do that, now start going after more leads, spend more money, spend more time, De delegate that work to somebody on, on your team or somebody that you hire. So we're going to look today at the organic side of marketing, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples at the end that will really demonstrate why that's so important. So having said that, if you're here to talk community building and relationship building and brand building on social media, you're in the right place. Let's talk about how to win at social media, even with no budget. Okay, first things first, why are you social media marketing? What are the objectives you could be trying to achieve when you're on social media for your business? Well, there are actually five that we're going to look at today. The first one being building your brand. This is a huge advantage that we have now as marketers because social media and some other tools as well give you an avenue to put the message of your brand out there as often as you want with full control over what you say 
relatively speaking, every now and then we might have some limitations we hit. But for the most part, you get to decide what story you're telling your audience, how you're putting your brand out there, what tone, what values you have. And, you know, back in the day when the only sources that we had to use thir third parties to get our information out there were like newspapers and magazines and radio and TV interviews and features, we didn't have a lot of those opportunities back then. They were really hard to come by. It was very competitive. Now we get to control the flow of information. Granted, it can be difficult to get people to it because all of those tools are very saturated, but the benefit remains if you can get people to one of your social media platforms, can you get them to feel like they really understand your business, like they can start trusting your business and like they want to learn more. Now, this brings us to number two as an objective, building your reputation is an important one. Uh, people need to know that they're making a good decision when they make a purchase decision or when they decide to hire you. And they may make that decision in a number of different ways. They may be looking for different types of validating information, but at the end of the day, we all need some way to prove that we're making the right choice before we make it. So help your audience out as much as you can and do that with anything that you can on social media, whether that be showing them the strength of your community as per number three, or by the little things that you tell them, you know, about, about you know, what you've achieved in your business or, uh, you know, the, the number of years you've been in business or any, anything that makes your business sound strong, that is something that's going to help your audience to understand that you're worth a look, that your products and services are worth a look. Now, this brings us to number three, creating community. Creating community, as I just hinted to, that is an extension of building reputation, but it also stands alone. So the stronger your community appears to be, it would suggest that there must be a reason why your community is so strong. And that speaks to reputation. But also, community is its own thing on social media because you can go out into the world of social media and start proactively engaging with people to build your audience and bring them back into your community. You can proactively grow your community on social media if that's part of your plan, which I hope that it is. Now, this brings us to number four, generating leads. I believe generating leads is a byproduct of doing the first three things well. So if you've built that brand reputation community, and then you give people a way to connect with you directly, that's now a lead that you can continue to talk to up until the point where you can, number five, generate your sales. So to me, you'll see this as a byproduct of doing those first four things well. If you've built that brand reputation and community, and then you've given away for people to connect with you one-to-one, -one, you've incentivized them to do that, now you've got this one-to-one -one conversation going and you can track it. You can meet their object, you can manage their objections. You can ultimately turn that into a sale. Of course, the trick is that a lot of us uh, may, look, I know you're a business owner or your business marketer, you want sales when you want, you want to spend time marketing and generate sales from it. The thing about social media is it's a slower burn. So if you've ever found that you've seen people who just hard sell all the time, it's actually counterproductive. You think that's going to get you more sales, but it actually makes people want to back away on, a, on tools like social media, where it's more about relationship building. So it's really important to think about some of these other elements as part of your strategy as well. So I'd like you to start now thinking about how this can work for your business. What I'd like you to do is really be able to pick a strategy, and it doesn't have to be just one, but how would you use these different elements to talk to your audience to build what you're trying to build on whatever platform you're on? So I'm going to throw a question to you because this is about making this relevant to your business. So which of these strategies make sense for your business? Go ahead and add into the chat there, which of these seem important to you? Maybe if you're on multiple platforms, maybe think about one of them and one audience and ask yourself, do I want to go for brand, reputation, community, lead, sales? It can be more than one, but I'd like you to think about how you would use these different strategies and which ones are going to be most useful to you as you try to talk to your specific audience. Elaine's jumping in and saying brand and community. Those are the two that she really wants to focus in on straight away. Thank you for that, Elaine. Yeah, if, if you're listening in live, this is a great chance to sort of jump in and let's see if 
if we have a trend, great. If we don't, that's fine too. Rose is saying brand. It, again, that's one of the huge advantages. We can control that element on social media and we can decide what we want to say. Miguel, brand, community, and sales, really focusing in on both ends of that, uh, that line. Michelle, community, reputation. Those are certainly strengths with, with social media. Erica saying community and leads. So I love that we're getting different answers here. You're all thinking about what's gonna work best for your business. And this is just part of what you infuse into your specific marketing strategy. Kim saying brand for you as well, reputation and community. So brand is definitely uh, something that a lot of people are honing in on. And so we're gonna make sure as we go through this presentation to dial in a little bit more specifically on how you can do that. But I love that you're all thinking about how this relates back to your business and that you're tailoring this to your business. Now, as you get, if you wanna to continue to get those answers in as, as you're on With Me Live, that's great. I've got uh, Tenzin saying uh, community, helping underserved small business owners. Okay, so you know exactly the community that you're looking to target here. So this is great. Well, I'm going to keep moving forward. If you still have answers coming in, that's perfect. I want you to really start fleshing this out for yourself. But let's look now at how you match that purpose or those purposes that you're looking at with target market, who specifically you're trying to reach. Now, I'm going to say target market a lot on this presentation. So let me define that for you. These are the people most likely to be interested in your product, service, program or idea, whatever it is you're selling, these are the people who'd want to buy it. And it's deceptive because in social media, we think, oh, millions of people are on this platform. That's great. But you don't need to reach all of those people. You only need to reach your specific audience. That's your goal. So when you think about that, which target markets are actually aligned with your social media strategy? I'll tell you, I'm on a few different platforms and I have a different target market that I'm trying to reach on each of them. So really think about what that means for you on any given platform. Now, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to show you how purpose and target market can complete, completely change your social media strategy altogether. Here's a business to business example for those of you who have a B2B type of business yourself, this may be useful. It's very specific, but we're looking for taking a wider lesson from it. So whatever this company is, they want to attract human resources directors of local companies. So what would that look like if we're trying to figure out how that fits into the first four objectives that I mentioned earlier? Well, from a human resources director standpoint, what do they want to know about your business? They want to know what it's like to do business with you. So, you know, they're gonna, their company, they're representing a company that has a value system of its own, a way of doing business of its own, and your company has to mesh with that. So anything that this business, the, the example business we're giving here can do to show this HR director will mesh well, that's gonna help this HR director make their decision. And in addition to that, the HR director wants to know that they're making a good choice. They may be the sole decision maker, they may be the budget holder, but they may not be. At the end of the day, this human resources director probably has to justify their decision somewhere along the way. So anything this business can do to say, all right, here's what makes us great. Here are the accolades that set us apart. Here are some stats to show you what you can expect. Anything that really shows the strength, the credibility of their products and services, can help a human resources director make their choice. Now, another extension of this would be able to say, look how strong our community is. We've worked with the following clients. We've got this type of experience. That speaks to reputation, but also the human resources director may be looking at community as part of their process. So if they're looking at two suppliers side by side, both seem to bring something similar to the table, but one gives them access to other companies or influencers they want to be able to approach. They want to be a degree closer of connection. Well, that could be a reason they make that choice. And after all of this, you know, what would you, what would this company do to directly get in front of these HR directors and make sure they're generating those leads? Well, where can they be? Where the HR directors will also be? You know, how do they? As a business owner, how do you know whether a company even allows their employees to be on certain social media platforms? Well, you're gonna to wanna to use a platform that really lends itself 
to conversations with HR directors. That might be LinkedIn, for example. It might be platforms where you can isolate certain hashtags and you can figure out who's having HR related conversations to get into those conversations. So already you're starting to see that purpose and target market really start to dictate where you are and what you're doing on social media. Now, here's another example just to show you the difference. Let's say you wanted to attract engaged couples who are planning a wedding. This is a B2C, business to consumer example, totally different. From a brand standpoint, it's actually about them. How are you going to showcase them and their love, see their day through your eyes? From a reputation standpoint, they want to know that you're going to be able to execute that, that you're actually good at what you do and that you're going to give them the day that they hope they'll have. From a community standpoint, you can show them other people who have had that experience, other happy couples, um, perhaps other vendors or suppliers that you have a relationship with. Ultimately, this is about them really trusting that they want to be a part of that community along with these others that they're seeing. And now for generating leads, well, if you can get people to see all these other things, now how do you get them to have that direct conversation with you? Is there something you can get them to sign up for? Is there something that you can incentivize them with that can get them into that direct one-to-one -one conversation? So when you look at this, it starts to lend itself towards experiential use of social media. You might wanna show them visuals. You might wanna show them video. You're going to want to give them a sensory experience so that they can imagine their day through your eyes. So where would that put you? Probably different places than the HR directors. And you can already see just by looking at these two different examples, social media gets used differently in both cases. Now, I want to get a little more specific with the brand, but also the community building pieces. So showcasing your brand. Let's look at that one here. Now, there's a really important concept that I want you to understand when it comes to social media. And actually, I think that this concept is useful off of social media as well. It's the idea of selling without selling. If you've ever had the experience of somebody just hard selling all the time, every post they do is a picture and a price tag. Anything you do to interact with them immediately gets you a direct message where they're trying to pitch it to you hard. That can be something that's pretty off-putting for a lot of consumers. So social media requires a certain nuance and subtlety, selling without selling, getting people's brains working around the idea of your business and getting into conversation with you about it so that their brains continue to work around your business long after your conversation is over or long after they've seen your post. So this could be talking about concepts or ideas, value systems, philosophies, stories, senses, using emotion. So I'm going to show you a few examples of this just to get you thinking. Here's a few from my own Instagram. And you can look at my Instagram if you want more examples, but there are certain ones that I play with more than others. So I encourage you to sort of go out into the world of social media and see how other people use different ones. So for me, this top left one, it's going into the values uh, idea. So you're gaining wisdom on this upward climb. I want to be encouraging. And I want people to come to my account because they are going to feel that encouragement. And I want to attract more people who want that in their lives. And, you know, generally I'm reaching small business owners, but we all know how hard it is to be in business, especially at a time like this. So having that value of encouragement be constantly reiterated fosters a community that wants more of that. So that's building based on value system. Now, the next one over, this is a quote from a blog that I wrote, cross-marketing is a content pillar unto itself. You can read this in a matter of seconds and you're being introdu introduced to the concepts that I do marketing. So if you're on my page long enough and you start seeing posts like this, you can't help but know that I do marketing. And there's going to be a link back to my website to read the full blog and get people, again, back to the website so they can explore everything else that's on the website. But you can read this and interact with this in just a matter of moments without having to invest anything more than a click of a button. The bottom here, this goes directly into community building. I've been featured on some podcasts. It also goes into reputation building, right? Because it shows that some people thought it was worth interviewing. And I'm going to share that type of content on my own platform to nurture those interviewers as well. So you see how I'm using all of these different strategies and different types of content. Now, there are some that I don't do a lot of. So for, I wanted to give you an example of engaging the senses. 
sweets and it's a presentation for me. So why not mention sweets? We've got cookies and we've got fudge in this one. You know, Toll House isn't saying cookie equals price tag. They're going to show me that bottom cookie broken open, that one chocolate chip oozing onto the table. It's warm. It's fresh out of the oven. It's melty. It's soft. I can almost smell it looking at this picture. And that now is going to make my brain want a cookie. And eventually I may buy one. The other thing Toll House did here is they put a recipe link back to their website to figure out exactly how to make these. There's logic to all of this, that all of this that they're doing. So if engaging with the senses could work for you, this is a kind of example of how to use that. Now, I've also got an example here for engaging emotions. I find this one very powerful. This one is from the sleep lady. You're tired and she's tired. It's a seven month sleep regression in full swing. There's this uh, picture here, your baby who got through the last sleep regression and was finally sleeping well day and night is suddenly waking early from her naps and up all night. I feel the frustration of this. You love the baby, but you really wish this baby would not be having this sleep regression happening. And this is really niggling at a pain point that some percentage of the audience is feeling with the idea that now if you click this link, maybe you're going to get some sort of an answer, some idea for how to solve this, some sort of reassurance. So again, you're gonna see this link back to the website, but the sleep lady is engaging these emotions and trying to make you think of the pain points so you can assume that the sleep lady has a solution. So with some of these examples in mind, what can you engage with your marketing? I want you to think about your business. Again, we're trying to tailor this back to your business. You can have more than one of these. If there's something you think I should have had on this list, but it's not on this list, go ahead and add it. Um, concepts, values, philosophies, stories, senses, emotions, all of this is fair game for you. And you're probably going to have more than one of these things that you play with along the way. But what could work specifically for a business like yours? that uh, you know we're all representing different industries here we if you saw from the introductions we all have different businesses but each of you probably has at least one of these that would work better for you so if you're on with me live feel free to put your thoughts into the chat if you're not take a moment maybe even pause the presentation here and just think which of these could work for you and i want to point out as you're doing that there is going to be an exercise that i share on the landing page link that I give you later that will help you work through exact examples that you want to use for this. So I encourage you, if this is something you want to get more specifics on, that you look at that later. Now, Michelle saying success stories tends and usually use stories or real facts and numbers really going in hard on the data. Um, yeah, and you know, in, in your case, using an alias for the client's name and the business name, sometimes we need to be protective of that, especially depending on your industry. So those are great ideas so far, but you know, for everybody, keep thinking about what you would do. And again, there will be an exercise for you to work on with this if you want to get as specific as possible and have it be actionable. Now, as you keep thinking about that, I just want to remind you to use the tools that you have that forward your specific purpose for your specific target markets. So your answer doesn't need to be like the person you just heard or the business next to you. It only needs to match what's right for you and your audience. And that's the important thing to remember here. Now, as you continue to think about that, I wanna get into one last section before we take questions. Um, and I'm noticing Kim saying the sense is primarily, it's all about food. I like it. Well, you're, you probably liked my cookies example then. So having said that, let's look a little bit at creating conversation. I do want to make sure I leave some time for questions here. So creating conversation, creating engagement, creating community is a really important part of social media. I want you to get people not only talking with you, but also about you and the conversations that they're having. Now, what do I mean by engagement? I don't just mean that if somebody comments on something you posted, you comment back. That I hope is a given. We don't want to ignore people who are coming to our pages. If they, whatever they said to us, as long as they're not uh, a bot, it's probably useful to have some sort of a customer service response to it. But let's go beyond that. You also can go out into the world of social media, find pages, find accounts, find influencers, find potential customers to interact with, 
Start engaging with them coming up in their notifications and bring them back to your page. That's how we grow reach. That's how we grow our audience. That's how you grow um, your reputation on social media. And what can that look like? That can look like liking other people's posts or reacting or whatever it's called on whatever platform you're on. Comment marketing is a thing. Going to other people's posts or again, whatever it's called on the platform and making comments as your business page, not to sell, but to ask questions, to give compliments, to be your brand, to show that you're paying attention to them. Then they'll start noticing, oh, somebody's doing that and they might come back to your page. Sharing content can be another way if it's relevant to your brand, if it's relevant to the type of content that you want to post yourself. And then hashtags. Certain platforms, Instagram, Twitter, certain platforms tend to use hashtags more. And it's a way to find searchable content or, or conversations happening about particular topics. And that can help you identify people you want to start talking with or conversations you want to get into. So these are ways to start coming up in other people's notifications to get them back to your own page. Now, I promised you up front that I was going to show you a couple of examples of why we talk about having engagement and building community and keeping those relationships and not just advertising, but using both strategies if you have the budget to supplement each other. Well, I'm going to show you an example of a company that I think advertised and was created creating conversation and one that I think advertised and was not creating conversation. Here's one from Starbucks. You can't even see the post here because there was so much else I wanted to show you. Here we've got a post from Starbucks that had 3,800 reactions, 372 comments, 412 shares. And what do you notice about this? Every single comment, this is just a snippet of the comment section. Every single comment got a reply from Starbucks, every single one of them. If the person wrote back again, Starbucks wrote back again. Starbucks responded to complaints, to questions, and to compliments. They were everywhere. So what does this mean? Number one, it means that they were doing everything that they could to extend their organic reach, even within a post that was probably sponsored or boosted or paid for to get more reach. So once people got there, they were continuing to perpetuate those notifications. They were, you know, put getting more comments out there, which weighs more, which is going to give them even more reach. And number two, if one of these people wrote in and got a response, how would that make them feel, right? They got a response from Starbucks. And number three, we can see all this. All of us can see all of this. It's public information. So what is the fact that Starbucks was here responding and what they were saying? How does that make you feel about their brand? It's just something that you add to the information you already have about their brand, and it helps you make a new decision about what their brand is for you. Here's a different example, not the company that I thought would be giving the different example, but here it is. So this is an old um, Halloween post from Hallmark. And this one, again, I think that they advertise this just based on the number of reactions being so much higher than to the ones to other posts. Um, here they had about 2,400 reactions, but nowhere near the comments of their shares. You're seeing the entire comment section here. Hallmark is nowhere to be found. They aren't even in the likes on these comments. And there were people here, for example, the first person who said your prices are way too high. Somebody else, not Hallmark, said they do sell 99 cent cards. What a great opportunity that would have been for customer service for, for Hallmark to say that very same thing and then provide a link to the 99 cent cards. So, you know, they didn't do anything beyond paying to continue to promote this post and to get more reach and to squeeze every last drop out of it. And the people who wrote in didn't hear back. So how would that feel? And we can see all this. So what does this make us think about this brand? And again, that's just something that you add to all the information you have about this brand already. So this is one of the reasons that I say, you know, it's so important not just to think about spending money, but to have a plan for what you're going to do with the new leads, the, the, the interest that comes in, the conversation that comes in. How can you maximize every relationship that you make on social media? Well, these are a few things I wanted you to be able to think about. Now, I do want to save time for questions here. So here's a reminder of what we talked about so you can get those questions in. We talked about some of those objectives, the five different objectives for being on social media to market your business. Then we talked about matching that purpose with your target market. 
Then we look specifically at two of the goals, showcasing your brand and creating conversation, which can feed into the community aspect as well. So use that to spark some of your questions. Feel free to get those into the Q&A. We'll be looking for those. And I just wanted to remind you, first of all, this top link is the landing page that has the slides, the attraction posts, the selling without selling posts exercise, and some additional blogs. Uh, Maureen and Kelly have that, and they'll be able, sure to send that out with you afterwards, along with the recording of this session. If there's a quick question that you wanted to ask that you don't get a chance to ask here, you are welcome to email me directly. I put my email here, but if you want a longer consultation, that's what the CSUBS VDC is for. So hopefully they'll give you some information about how to get a consultation with their advisors directly as well. And I'm going to bring them back in as well so we can take some of these questions that may be coming in. Uh, Kelly, uh, if you wanted to jump in, feel free to go ahead and say anything that you wanted about the SVDC as well. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. That was, that was outstanding. Um, and there is plenty of time for you to still get your question in. And yes, we do have an expert in social media consulting. So do reach out if you have any questions after here. And Melissa, I have a few questions that were actually sent to me uh, that aren't in the question box. So let me start with these. Some businesses can be intimidated by social media. What steps can they take that make them more feel more comfortable? What steps can they take to overcome that and feel more confident in using even, even one social media platform? Mm. That's a really good question. So I think one of the things that can make us feel intimidated is the, well, there's a couple different aspects. One is the feeling that, how am I going to, I barely have enough time to run my business. How am I going to be over here and over here and over here? I actually think the way this question was phrased is perfect in that I'm a believer to start with a smaller number of platforms. Like it, if you're building social media marketing into your strategy, you don't need to be everywhere at once. If anything, I find that a lot of businesses that are on many different platforms are having conversations with nobody on all of them, and it doesn't necessarily make their business look better. So start with what feels realistic to you. Pick one platform that you want to try and try some things offline as well for marketing your business and use it as an experiment to see what works best for you. Pick one that you think would lend really well and just try to start having conversations with people that you can start putting a face to your audience. Build some good relationships and you'll start to see the value of the things that you say about your business. I think the other thing that can intimidate people about social media is the idea of networking or talking about their business at all. And that goes far beyond social media. So I wanted to mention that quickly too, that if you feel like you're having a hard time talking about your business, just remember that what's interesting to you about the stuff that you do, share that with people. If it's interesting to you, it may be interesting to other people. And at the end of the day, if you're connecting with your target market, these are people who you can potentially help by giving them this type of information. So don't feel like, oh, I'm, I'm tooting my own horn. I want to be humble. I'm afraid to talk to people and be salesy. You don't have to be salesy. Tell them what interests you about what you do. You don't have to put a hard pitch at the end, just start getting comfortable with having conversations with people and try to build some good relationships to inspire that. Fantastic. Well, also, uh, Maureen has added the link above here uh, into the chat box. So feel free to go in and grab it now and you could even get it quicker, that information. Awesome. Number two, our images are obviously important to include with content. What are some of the resources you recommend when it comes to free, paid, or even using a cell phone to take photos? Good questions. Well, uh, if you're taking your own photos, then I guess we all, m many of us do have cell phones that would allow us to do that. But if you're looking for stock photos, a couple of resources that I would suggest, you know, I can put them in the chat, but not everybody is listening to this live. Um, Pixabay.com, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y.com is one example of a stock photo site that it, it does have a few, a section that has some paid stock photos, but there's, you know, you can search for free stock photos as well. Another one that I like is unsplash.com, making sure that I spelled it right, U-N-S-P-L-A-S-H.com. Another thing that you could potentially use, some of us may be aware of Canva. 
canva.com putting that in the chat as well and canva.com is more about creating graphics it's a great tool for non-graphic designers like me to create graphics that look halfway decent uh, but you can also search for photos within that and all of these things have free levels of their service so i'm sure there's many other examples out there and for those of you who are on live if you have things that you like feel free to pop that into the chat because i'm always looking for good resources too great well, let me change the background here for a sec sure and uh actually bring us in for the final question that i have and there's still time to get another question answered so please go to the q a box if you have a question so for the final question that i have how can i pick the most effective hashtags for facebook and instagram is there a place to go to to see what is trending well, you know, it's actually helpful to do research for this on a platform like Instagram, because Instagram, when you're looking up, if you start typing into the search, a hashtag, uh, it'll start to tally up for you how many results there are for that hashtag. And they'll, they'll, they'll do a, they'll do a, a search result for you that ranks them based on how many hashtags they're seeing. Um, so I would say, you know, anytime you're looking at uh, a hashtag for something you are posting, you want to make sure that the stuff that's relevant to what you posted is in there. If location matters, put a bunch of location hashtags. If material or type of product or service is important, which it probably is for most of us, put as many different types of words in there as you can think to mention. You can do up to, they limit you at 30 hashtags. And to be honest, some people say go less than that, but if I'm being honest with you, the more you come up in, the more searchable you are. So give yourself a chance to come up in some searches. Now, if you have way more than 30 that you'd like to be mentioned in, uh, be, be aware that the ones that are, like if I, for example, am choosing small business, hashtag small business versus, versus hashtag woman owned small business, there's probably going to be a lot more people posting to, let's say, hashtag small business. And so it might be easier for my post to get buried more quickly. So you want to look for, if you've got so many that you can't even choose, look for ones that you're more, that are getting searched somewhat frequently, but you're more likely to stay at the top of the search for longer. Um, but those are some ideas to think about as you start doing your hashtag research. Fantastic. Excellent stuff. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. It's great having you on this week. I look forward to maybe running into you in September if you're at our national event. Absolutely. I will be there presenting a topic. And I thank you so much for having me. I just wanted to ask once again, Kelly, can you remind us how people contact the SVDC to get a session? Absolutely. A lot of ways. You could use the telephone number I gave you earlier. You can go online and look at CSUBSBDC. You can find us basically uh, at the drop of a hat. So reach out, reach out if you have any questions, you want, need some consulting. We'll be back next week with our webinar next week. And our guest is going to be Mr. Morgan Clayton. And Morgan is a founder, a successful entrepreneur. Uh, he founded a business in a recession, and I look forward to even asking him about that. 1982, founded a business during a recession that I hope we don't have this time around, Teltech Security Systems, a regional business in California, Nevada. So we'll be back next week, talk about a lot of the great work he's done in our community as a community leader, work with underserved communities and some programs implemented. So, Melissa, thanks again so very much. Great to have you. Thank you for having me. And so for Maureen busher Dang, our executive producer, and Melissa, I'm Kelly Bearden. We'll be back next week, everybody. See you then. Have a great week. Bye-bye now.